Hey guys, DJ Ravine here with Point Blank Music School, and today we have a special guest with us. This is Cove. How you going, man? Good. Thanks for having me down. A bit of history about yourself. What kind of music do you produce? So I'm pretty much focused on drum and bass. Mm -hmm. I've dabbled in other genres in the past. I never really realized it, but at this stage I've actually been knocking around for quite a while. How long have you been producing? I think I started around my first sort of forays into it were about 2007, um, back when Logic came on like six discs. Right. Yeah, I had to install each one and it was hugely expensive. Then I started that and yeah, and just slowly, slowly grew for that and I just knuckled down to, to doing this. Um, really doing it full on probably about since 2012 i think my first record came out and you've been using logic the whole time yeah all the way through from seven up to uh x now awesome so tell us a little bit about the track that we're going to be taking a look at today so today we're going through my newest one called echoes um which is a bit of a shift for me recently because i've been doing a lot more dance floor stuff but this is sort of a bit of a throwback to my more sort of liquid mm. rolling roots um I hadn't done a vocal track for a while, um, just been sort of working with samples and really going back to how I was working. But with this one, I'd done a session a few years ago with a singer called Ben Duffy from a band called Finesse Soler. We just got together and we originally wrote this as a house tune with the potential that it would go on, you know, you pitch it and publishing all that route. But I loved the tune and I just sort of sat on it and worked on it a tiny bit here and there. And then I started thought, oh, okay, I'll drop it in a set, and like, I found like a few appropriate moments where I could drop it. Well, let's go and have a listen cool. to the track. I love the guitars, man. Thanks. They're amazing. Where'd you record them? Um, so this was all done just at my old home studio mm -hmm. when I lived back in Woolwich. Um, yeah, just sat there plugging away. <laughs> nice. So what you had some uh, like distortion on the guitar already, or yeah. So I mean, these were pretty much DI straight into the right. computer. Dry. Um, yeah. So you take all of that off. It's an incredibly uninspiring. <laughs> um, yeah, just DI straight in here. And then, you know, I feel like a lot of Logic's plugins are quite underrated. Um, and especially this, this pedal board one. Hmm. Um, because it is such a long-winded process to get your pedals out, get them all in, make sure there's not noise going on in the signal path. Whereas these ones work really well. Um, as you see, I mean, I've got, what, eight or nine different, yeah. different pedals on here. Like little secret ones, like their Space Echo emulation and the Spring Reverb. They're fantastic working on anything else um, in the mix. Yeah, and then really sort of takes it up to that level. And I do love that sort of really nice tremolo picked mm. wide sound and you can just, it doesn't have to be clean. And especially in electronic music now, it's sort of so important that your signal is as clean as possible. And I think it's nice to get away from that and put in these sort of slightly messier sounds. 
So you actually had a, you had a guitar rig on there as well. So there's a guitar rig on there as well, which is just giving it a bit of a cabinet sound. Right. Because okay. otherwise it's sounding too much like a DI and you want that sort of mid-range honk. Mm. Um, and I suppose really when it comes to doing guitars on here, it's important to make sure that, you know, that the peaks are making sure they're not coming through too much, especially around 3K, because guitars can get really toppy around there. Yeah, I mean, they're a bit more long-winded to mix in, but I think it's worth doing it. Yeah, definitely. It, it definitely has paid off, I reckon. Yeah. This sounds great. <laughs> so, um, okay, let's go and take a look at um, the beginning of the track. Yeah. So just straight up from the start, I did notice one thing, and you work a lot in audio. Yeah, I mean, for two reasons. A, you know, it's a CPU hog to have a load of MIDI open. And I think mainly for this track, when it's sort of chord based, it's nice to sort of be able to bounce something out and then it's done and then play with it there. And with a few of the things in here, I have an old um, a Wattcat tape echo at home, um, which I like to run a lot of the signal through, like with these choir pads. And you get quite a lot of dust coming off of that which is running through that tape echo. And yeah, once I've got that pad there, it doesn't really need anything else. And, you know, more is less, I think. You know, more is less, I think. As long as you've got the core sort of foundation of having these chords here, everything on top of that is just there to augment it a bit. So just having these pads here, which again, are super dusty, a lot of like- Atmospheric. Atmospheric sort of Very. Mellotron choir sounds going on yeah, there. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Mellotron. And now there's a, a built-in one in Logic, so. Is that the one that you're using? Um, I think previously I was using um, a third-party emulation, but now they've got it in Logic, I'll use that. With that e-piano that you're using, mm. that's all inbuilt Logic? That's all inbuilt Logic, yeah. I mean, as I've said, I think, you know, Logic is supposed to be a flagship music production device. It's all in one, really. And it really is all in one. Mm. And a lot of these things, once you process them right, they're sounding good. And I've just taken the tops off that, just to, Mm. just to make it a bit warmer and rounder. And that's obviously a conscious choice, especially mm. at the beginning of a track. You don't yeah. want it to just kind of go really in your face. No, and you, especially with something like that, there's going to be vocals on top. And when it's a lower male vocal, that's taking up such a huge chunk of the mid-range that you don't really need that fighting with too many transients from an electric piano. Cool. And I've just, just looking after the low mids there. So for your drums, do you do much processing? <coughs> You've comped these drums into like one yeah. long file. So how do you actually do it at the start? Do you just, you just mostly sample based? So at the start, it would be sample based. And then just over time, I've accrued so many kicks and snares and what have you that it's very easy to just drop them in. But especially with Logic, I've found if you've got a string of samples and they're not joined, that is just going to crash your computer. Really? So, yeah. So when possible, you know, make oh, sure it, make sure it's one one you know sort of long file like this. So does it just do something with CPU or something? Yeah. Or? Oh, yeah. Wow. It just spikes it if you've got loads. And you know, as you can see, there's so many layers there that that if you've got each individual sample playing, it's just gonna it's just gonna crash. Before you comp them all, mm. did you literally just drag them onto the timeline? Yep. One by one. Yep. Yeah. I've never really been one for sort of messing around with putting it in the ESX or anything like that. I like working in audio. There's something sort of very nice about audio and you can, especially with flex time now, you can do so many interesting things with audio that you couldn't before. Mm. You can pitch something down, you pitch something out. And if you stick a snare in and you want to pitch it up and sort of, you know, get those sort of very on trends, high, you know, 200, 350 hertz snares, you can do that just through pitching it up and down within Logic. It's not killing the CPU. And also within the algorithms, you can get so many different effects. Like if you have it on the polyphonic algorithm, that's going to make it sound one way mm -hmm. and it'll be quite smooth. And this works really well with bass sounds. So if you have a, a bass womp and you have it on a polyphonic algorithm, it's going to sound really smooth. But then if you put that into monophonic, it's going to sound crunchy. And you can do so much within that, stretch it out, get a little cut there. Do you have any examples of that? Uh, this is probably the wrong track. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, the the guitar riser in this is a good example of that. So this would have just come from one note. So that's just been one note that's been stretched out. And because there's a slight bend in there, mm. over time, that's turning into this sort of atonal riser that I think is much more interesting than just having a <laughs> You know, yeah, going that's on. True. Well, back to drums. Mm. Do you have anything that you do to them processing wise? I'm a big lover of saturation and tape emulation. And I think it gives a lot of stuff a nice roundness 
Whereas if you've got too many snares, that can often that can and you know your transients are all at the same time, that's going to start causing havoc. And with saturation, it's never as aggressive as distortion, but you're still getting that transient being rounded off. I mean, that's probably not the scientific way of explaining it, but it seems to work nicely. So such on this kick layer I've got here. That's just had that put on it. And there's so much more transient with it off and with it on, it's just filling it out a bit more, making that mm. signal more full. And you can end up buying yourself a lot of volume just by doing that because your signal is being leveled out like that. So I can see you've layered a lot on the kick. Yeah. So how many channels is that exactly? Uh, so the kick, I think we've got here. Um, Let's have a listen to that. So two kicks there, then I think those two bit taking up the high end and then the low end being operated just by itself. And I like doing that because it gives you more control. And I'm also, when it comes to kicks, this is something that has a lot of emphasis in house music, but making sure everything's in tune properly because mm. everything does have that fundamental. And again, this is so easy to do these days simply by pitching it up. And that's going to be much more easy to work out what that note is. Mm. And whether that's either playing it on a keyboard, because quite often the tuner can be a little off because of mm. the, the pitch envelope going on. But it's good to make sure everything's in tune because everything will combine together so much. But actually, that's a great tip, like pitching up the kick like a couple of octaves and then you can it actually get, becomes a tone. Yeah, because everything has a fundamental frequency to mm. it. I mean, even hats. Mm. And as I say, it's sort of a lot more prevalent in, in house music, but to get everything to play together nicely, mm. if they're all matched up, they'll interact more. Cool. Do you have anything on the drum bus? On the so tone? on the drum bus, I've got... Sausage fattener. Sausage fattener. I've just done a couple of dips here, just as some problem frequencies. I love using the channel EQ in Logic. It's there, it's got its own box, it's simple. And from my personal perspective, I can't tell a huge amount of difference when you're cutting frequencies between this and an um, analog emulation. Or yeah, I mean, even I, the Fab Filter's great, but mm. I've just got so used to this over time that, you know, it works. Yeah, it's same works. for me. I use Ableton personally, yeah. but I use the EQ8, which is the inbuilt one. Mm just because it's just there, it's easy. Yeah. Then I've also got this, which is a great little plugin, um, which is the MV2 from Waves. Mm -hmm. And what this does... It's not doing a huge huge amount on here, but it, it effectively an up and down compressor, I suppose. Mm. And it just brings up the lowest points of the signal and brings down the highest points. So you can, again, without processing it too much and getting the sound of compression, I'm never a big user of compression. And I'll limit stuff, but in terms of actually getting into the nitty gritty and compressing stuff, I don't do a huge amount of that. And then, yeah, just a nice. I mean, again, I think with a lot of this, it's all about incremental gains. Yeah. So if you've got sausage fattener, don't put it to 80%. <laughs> unless that's what and you unless want. Unless that's what you yeah. want, because it, you know, it can do great things. It, and even when it comes to saturation and things like that, tiny amounts over time, it's marginal gains, and they will all come to add up to something much fuller. So I've always kind of just wondered, because I've never really found the answer to this, but what is Sausage Fattener actually doing? <laughs> but it's, so, I think cause, it's, it's a lot of compression and a lot of dry. And I think the color might just be some sort of sort of shelving EQ or it something. It's something to the dynamics. Yeah. Like it's if you turn it up, it's more like you get more high frequencies yeah, or low frequencies, exactly. something like that. But I mean, yeah, it, brilliant, really. Two yeah, knobs, know. So two knobs, so and great. funny little lad there. So that's yeah. good. And then yeah, I think I've just rolled off. I've just rolled off the very very lows there. Yeah, just to make sure nothing's fighting too much with the sub. But aside from that, not a huge amount of processing. It's it's just samples I've accrued over time layered together so they interact well. I think what might be of interest is the hats in this because there are an awful lot of hat layers, but it's all about how they interact as one rhythm and they're all their different tones and timbres all coming together. Now, if you just have one hi-hat, 
doing that same rhythm, that is nowhere near as interesting as all these different sounds interacting mm. and coming together. And especially if you've got, you know, breaks and you're going for that older school sound, you want those those drums with a bit of character. Um, I think also it's it's worth noting when it comes to hi hats. Again, this is all talking about frequencies and making sure nothing's fighting there and dipping where ones are hitting. So a lot of a hi hat is in the mid range mm. and getting a bit of thump, especially if it's something with a lot of character and tone to it. Um, so you want some of it to take over the mid range and some to take out that high hiss rather than having just a hiss going on because then it won't really sound like a hi hat. Yeah, I think that's also quite important as well. And, and mixing it is quite important because I've heard so many tracks out there where the hats are mixed so loud, yeah. it literally hurts to turn it, like you turn it up at a regular volume and all you hear is hats. Yeah, high, sort of high end balance is, is always, I think that's the holy grail really mm. of, of music production is the low end balance and the high end balance. And you want your hi hats to be that high end, but if you have too much of it, as you say, you're just getting white noise hiss. Mm. And if you listen to you know rock records or funk records or anything like that, that hi-hat isn't taking up that real f sort of fizz area. It's taking up a lot of the rhythm and you've got to remember it's a rhythm instrument, not an mm. effect. So by having all these, all those layers interacting with each other, you're getting much more of a sort of old school groove feel to it. Cool, let's go into the first part where the bass comes in. Yeah, so we've got, Big up for my organization. Honestly, it's pretty good. You've got everything. <laughs> you should have seen it before I organized it. Uh, right, here we go. Here's the bass. So this is a pretty simple bass line because, because it's a vocal tune, you don't really need anything too over the top. Because um, if you start putting growls and stuff in there, then that's just unnecessary stuff going on. You want the focus to be on there. So it's really there just to serve as an under, underlay to the harmony and make sure that it's all so feeling full. And in full, it sounds like this. So yeah, nothing sort of too over the top. I mean, these are now, I can't take ownership of this patch at all. This is from a Subfocus tutorial that was oh. on computer music years ago. And it's it's the terrorist, Reese, And he did this way of getting something that's incredibly full and fat and has that mid-range rumble, really. And it's a classic sound, so you can't really go wrong with it. Because especially when it comes to drum and bass, a lot of like emphasis put on, you've got to have this sine wave under everything all the time. But a sine wave in and on itself isn't that interesting mm. at all. There's no, well, it's just one harmonic. It's good to make sure that there's something reinforcing that as well. Now, whether that's low passing a saw, so you've got harmonics there, or doing something like this where you've got that big fat bass line there. This one's in mono, just going straight down the middle. And this one here is, I've effectively made a band pass there. Um, and I just want that area to be emphasized a lot more in the stereo. And as you can see, I've got the, the wet way up there. Mm. So it's going to be flapping about. But because of that band pass, it's still quite controlled. Then I have this, which is the track spacer. Great plug-in. And then I've just given that a bit of a limit, even though it's not actually doing anything. But all that's doing is making stuff wide. And um, once you have width, you've got a bit more of that loudness and you've got this sort of bed that it's sitting on. and sort of feels much more enveloping than if you've just got something straight down the middle. But you never want to do that to your sub bass because no. then you're going to have stuff pinging all over the shop. Yeah, you want your sub to be generally as modern as possible. Yeah, I think that that holds less weight now because you know there isn't so much emphasis on cutting to vinyl. And I think club systems now, don't quote me on this, but I think club systems can handle a lot more in terms of the stereo field going on. I think what I'd normally do, but I haven't done it on here, is I'd have the ozone imager making sure everything below a certain frequency is mono. But yeah, you can still get away with a lot of width. And once you have width, you get that perceived volume and you get that perceived, you know, sort of bed of sound. One of the nice things about Ableton actually, for Ableton users out there, they've released utility and updated it in Ableton 10. Yeah. And there's actually just a stock plugin and you can click a button that just says bass mono and then right. choose how many Hertz you want it to be mono from. So like, everything under 120 hertz is going to be great, modern. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so, so Logic will have that in about five years, probably. <laughs> Took them a long time to get out of the warp <laughs> flex thing. So, yeah. There you go. And I think on this base, I've just got another layer of this with another chorus on it, just to widen that even more. But that's so low in the mix that it's probably not doing a, a huge amount there. And that goes on throughout the whole track, right? Doesn't yep. It doesn't change. No, I feel like there's enough interest going on in the other aspects of the track. You've got to be interesting in your note selection and make sure you're playing with the rhythm of the track rather than just having you know, a long F and then D sharp, or whatever. But yeah, just good to make sure that everything is interacting with each other. That's what I think. So all of this purple stuff here, is that yeah. the vocal area? <laughs> this, is, this is the vocal and it's a bit of a hodgepodge of a vocal. Um, but I thought it was interesting because this is the vocal that we recorded in the studio on a mic that wasn't in isolation at all. And this was the original vocal that we recorded. Hazy, we're drawing in the night air. In slow mo, I know. We're letting go of our hearts and our heads. So, we used the scratch vocal and I think so much of what I love about this track is that sort of vocal and it's not a perfect vocal. I, I don't even think it's been tuned or anything too, you know, too sort of over-processed or anything like that, but we still got the sound of the room in the track. And that's what the first note of the drop is the room noise. Yeah. And if you take that out, it just doesn't have the same impact. Then with that room sound in, you just have this little burst of noise there, of like rumble and, because obviously I was playing that chord in the background, you've got that, you know, 10 foot away from the mic recording and it just gives it a little bit of studio magic really, I think. You're being a bit creative with what you've got as well. Like yeah, exactly. it's, it's, it's maximizing what you've got at that moment in time and not everything needs to be a perfect recording. Um, and on top of that, it's unique, it's not a sample. That's you know? true, that's true. What I've done here with, with this track is... Echoes, rock walls, beating to the ground with your skin, my bones, moving to the sun, right by... So with that, you can hear where that stretching's occurred, but it fits in with the vibe of the tune. So I think that, that would have been probably five or six different vocal takes all put together into one stack. Because I was listening to a lot of like shoegaze music at the time. Okay. So having those sort of big layered vocals and washed out reverb was something I really wanted to, to put in these sort of tunes and it, it fitted this. And as you can hear, that's been really compressed. So all those little noises, I think you can hear. You can hear, hear hi-hats yeah, and stuff Yeah, you can hear that, yeah. The, the backing track. Yeah, you can hear that. And um, that has become that layer again and just adding this, this sort of other dimension to it. Do you have a go-to kind of vocal processing chain that you use? Or? I would normally. Again, this, <laughs> this, is, unique track this, is, this is slightly different. So really with this, it was more about control and making sure that whilst we wanted that rawness to it, that there wasn't too much of it. So getting rid of all that rumble, especially when you're recording a lower male, a lot of that sort of around 150 to 200 can get quite stacked and quite messy because it's just the nature of the male voice so that it's mm. going to be going to be lower. So it's good to sort of, if you want your track to sound less intimate and more at a distance, getting rid of that first sort of harmonic of the lower voice will normally give you that distance without having to slather the whole thing in reverb. Mm. And especially I can imagine with drum and bass music mm. where you're working so much on the low end, yeah. you definitely want to make sure. You want sure. that room. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. And then I've just given this um, a limit as well, just to again control anything going on. It's quite a heavy DS going on here because it was a very sibilant, I think is the word, mm -hmm. very sibilant vocal take, um, which wasn't awful, but once you've got those peaks going, that's going to be interfering with, with anything down there. The highs and everything. Again, just to control this lower mid area with just making sure that, I mean, I don't... It's not doing a huge amount. It's still letting that first harmonic come through, but just keeping everything under control. I've got this, which is one of my favorite plugins. Um, I've actually never seen this one. So this is the Altiverb. Um, and it's a convolution reverb rather than a algorithmic or whatever. Okay. One of the other ones. And it's got 
a whole host of... Like classic reverbs? Yeah, classic reverbs. And it's got absolutely loads of them here. And it's got fantastic springs and, you know, old school digital reverbs. And plate reverbs. Plate reverbs, everything. And it's got really good stuff. It's very CPU heavy, but if you're looking to get that sort of older school sound and classic sound, mm -hmm. this is fantastic. Can you play that without and with it on? Yeah. And then with it on. So it's quite a, a thick reverb going mm. on there. Um, and also there's the delay in the delay in the original vocal file. Again, that's sort of adding another another layer to this. With this, there's like an A and a B to the vocal part. By having this... So this Redux vocal here, as I've named it, is the raw vocal files bounced out, and then I've tried to edit as much as I can to keep it as clean as possible. And the idea being that we were going to clean everything up and put it like that until we put the old vocal back on. So I've got these two vocal files that are the same, but processed entirely differently, interacting together. And again, this is a, a copy of that. So all together... And because we got the A and the B part of the vocal, I wanted the difference between those. So the second part of that, this copy that I have, I've sampled delayed, so it's getting so much wider. So you're getting the first part of the chorus and then the response getting wide. And with these hard compressed copies, I've just made sure there's no crackle going on there. With, I mean, this is great, super useful for compressing basses too much or adding a lot of top end. You can get artifacts and this is really good at quietly getting rid of them. And then here, I've just added a bit of top end, like a nice shelf, just to get that nice sheen that we all want, really. And then a trusty de to make sure there's nothing harsh coming through. What did you actually record this on, like? I think this was on my 20 pound AKG mic nice. that I had knocking around. No pop shield, nothing. See, this is the thing, guys. <laughs> this is what people don't understand, is you don't need expensive gear to make great music. No. Like, we've had people coming on here and they're showing a track at their, you know, it's got a million streams mm. on Spotify, and they're like, yeah, I recorded the vocal on my iPhone. Well, th this is it, and you know, <laughs> technology has got us to the, the stage now where we can do stuff like that. If it works, it works. There's no right and wrong way of doing it. So if you record it on a cheap mic, who cares? Yeah, it doesn't matter. True. So also here, I've I've made some sort of effects, some rises out of the vocal as well. So that's just reversing the audio and stretching it out. And as you can hear in there, because of that hi hat that's in the printed on the recording anyway, that's reversing as well. Mm. So you're getting this sort of tape stop effect. Sounds so cool, man. All these little mistakes and stuff can really help to give it a lot of character. And then there is, as well, I've just sort of got some distorted versions. It just sort of washes everything out. Yeah, you've used a lot of the vocal for like effecty kind of yeah. things. Yeah. And I always think that's a nice and interesting way to generate interest that isn't just something too obvious. Mm. Let's take a look at the main chorus as well. So the main chorus, you've just got drums and the bass going. So drums, bass, and it's a, a quiet, which has sort of got this rotor cabinet on it, giving that sort of old school 70s spinning mm. sound. Um, but that's not really high in the mix at all because there's all this other stuff going on and all those sort of sounds from the vocal are doing that job for me, really. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that really is all that's on the drop. So you've got these guitars that are about to come in. Yeah, right so they're all the guitars together when they come in. 
and that one as well is You know, if you played that to me mm. and you didn't tell me it was a drum bass track, I would, I would never know. <laughs> no, it, it does sort of have that, that vibe to it. Um, I love that reverse bit. Yeah, so there, there are two reverse lines. There's this higher one, which is... And then there's another reverse line, which is... Definitely heard that one a lot more. Yeah. And again, it's all about just these subtle layers and just the way they all interact. So these are just super simple, washed out. Just very lazily strummed, you know, tremolo. Your classic sort of chill out beach sort of that's surf what, that's what, chord bus. Yeah, surf chord bus, exactly. A huge amount of pedal board and this this space echo emulation that I keep on going on about. Again, as I've said about guitars, just making control and making sure that there's not a lot of mid range popping out and everything like that really. I'm all for guitar going on tracks, but don't just plug your squire into guitar rig and start strumming away. <laughs> that yeah, meant, there has you know, to be a little bit of thought involved. You, you have to treat it like it is, you know, its own entity. And, you know, like, like we were talking about with, with vocals and at the end of the day, you do want that sort of nice recorded mic sound and to sort of think about it in that way. Really. I'm a big fan of making sure that there's atmospheric noise and a lot of sort of incidentals in there as well. So throughout the whole track, this is running which is just, just a crackle, vinyl crackle. And subconsciously, as soon as we hear vinyl crackle, we're going, oh, cool, old. Yeah. So again, just sort of bolstering that sort of old school vinyl -y analog sound. And then I've got this sort of thunder effect in. Just to give it, put it in a place. And also I've got this as a, a rhythm line, which is in the intro and the breakdown, which is. Just crickets. Did, and you that... did you tune the crickets? Did you tune the crickets? The, cr <laughs> the crickets aren't tuned, but they're time stretched. I think that's hugely important to make sure that there's an atmosphere and a place to give to give your track context before the lyrics or anything comes in. There's just a few more effects and stuff, um, which isn't anything too sort of over the top. How does that sound in the context of the whole track? That's, I can see what you've done there because what that does is it kind of gets you ready for the next section yeah, of the track. Yeah, it's there, but it's not too prevalent. One last thing mm. is, uh, do you master yourself or do you send it off? So this one, I did end up mastering myself. I'm not sure what, I think it was pretty, pretty simple. Um, that was just a little bit of, multi-band compression just to control the low end. And then what I would have done on this is just to use Ozone 8 on there. What I would have ended up doing is using the dynamic EQ to locate and control any problem areas and then dip them down, but only very, very subtly. And then just from there to make it loud, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, would have used the maximizer, which is there. So that would have gone after that. Normally I'll use this IRC4 on the transient mode. And then with drum bass, I think you can get away with quite a lot of transient emphasis on there as well. A reasonably fast attack and 
a little bit of stereo independence. And yeah, just try and get it sort of competitively loud, really. All right, thank you very much, Code, for coming in. That was Echoes by Code. So where can they go and get this track? Uh, so this is available, well, it's on Spotify, um, available on Beatport, iTunes, YouTube, on Drum Bass Arena. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for watching and thank you, Co, for coming down Thanks, all man. this way. Appreciate it. And of course, check out pointblakemusicschool.com if you want to find out more about dance music production and just make music in general. We do offer a free little online taster course as well, so you guys check that out. And of course, like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you guys later.